Today's video is going to go over some testing that I recently completed on the Marshall JMP model 1987 50 watt amplifier. Before I get into the testing, I want to go over this amplifier's history. This amp was a research platform for a special studies course that I was doing on audio frequency vacuum tube amplifiers while studying electrical engineering. It started with a blank chassis that I had custom made, which I punched and drilled myself. Can you tell? The amp had several tweakable features, including a pentode triode switch, fixed cathode bias switch, a switched and variable negative feedback, and bias test points that read plate current through one tube for gathering data, which was used in a 22-page report at the end of the class. I eventually decided to transplant the amp's guts into a better chassis and purchased a Mojo Tone chassis and faceplate set, and sold the old chassis and its aluminum knobs on the classified section of a vintage guitar amp forum. It was during this transplant that I realized I'd made an error in my original layout. I had assumed half-inch spacing on the turret board instead of the 3 8 inch spacing that it should have had. The turret board barely fit into the chassis. I would later correct my error with a GP03 turret board with much better components. And then I sold the half-inch spaced turret board in the classified section of a vintage guitar amp forum. Just look at the difference between these two circuit boards. I did keep the pentode triode switch and the bias test points fitted to the back panel and installed a rich mod post phase inverter master volume where the low input of the normal channel input used to be. I also purchased a Weber small box head cab to house the amplifier. The cabinet I was using at the time was an Avatar 2x12 loaded with one Celestion 25 watt greenback and one Celestion vintage 30. Later, I found a Marshall 1966A 2x12 cabinet for sale locally and bought it for $190. I transplanted the greenback and the vintage 30 from the Avatar into the 1966A and dropped the G12T75s from the 1966A into the Avatar and sold the Avatar. I eventually realized that I had ordered an 80s style head cab from Weber and replaced the white piping with gold piping, which looked much better. I later sold the 1966A when I spotted a Marshall 1960A 4x12 cabinet locally for $300. It was loaded with two vintage 30s and two G1275s, so I dropped the G1275 into the 1966A and dropped its vintage 30 into the 1960A, but this time with a Creamback M65. This is the cab that I have been using during my recent testing. I sold the 1966A for $250, so this cab was only a $50 upgrade. As you can see, this amp setup has been through quite a transformation over the years, especially recently with its new power transformer. Now, let's get to testing. Okay, I've got the 1987 50 watt Marshall. Um, it's electrically, it's just like I want it. I've played it a few times and it sounds really good. I haven't been able to turn it all the way up because I don't want to blow my ears out. So today we're going to use the microphone. We're going to go into um, some recording software and I'm going to put on some headphones and play through a about 2007 Gibson Les Paul standard with burst bucker pro pickups in it. And we're going to sound, we're going to hear what it sounds like here in this. I've got a cream back uh, 65 the Creamback M65 Celestion here, and all in this 4x12, everything else is loaded with Vintage 30s. So we're gonna listen to this through Creamback 65, Vintage 30, and I've got a G12 T75 that I will try to play it through also, just to kind of hear what those what that sounds like. Okay, I've got the amp plugged in, and this is the kind of noise floor we're dealing with at 50 watts all the way up. I did have some squealing, and I was trying to figure out where that was coming from. I was a little disappointed. Then I realized I got this really junka, junky Hosa cable. I've not really been impressed with Hosa cables. This is this little jumper. I plugged this in. I, as soon as I unplugged this, it stopped squealing. So I'm going to disconnect this. Um, playing through the high treble channel. I'll see if I can get another cable that doesn't cause squealing. If I put a better quality cable in there and it squeals again, then that'll give me an opportunity to kind of figure out where it's coming from by moving wires around with this. So 
But uh, that's a good sign that if I take this junky cable out, I was hoping to just give this to the person that buys the amp. But unfortunately, it's garbage. So we'll, uh, we'll try it out. I did verify that this was indeed a HOSA cable, being that it had HOSA molded into the plastic on the connectors. Okay, I've got a different cable plugged in. It's not squealing, it's all the way up. So we're gonna give this a try. One thing to keep in mind in this testing is that I took about 10 seconds to choose a mic placement on these speakers. I was just looking for something that sounded pretty good at the time and not looking for any particular sound, so keep that in mind. They might sound very similar, they might sound very different, I don't know. Also, the amp is set at extreme settings with everything on 10, or is it 11? Okay, I barely had enough cable to run this uh, 1x12 cabinet up to the head there, and so we're going to play it to the G12T75. Um, I'm just going to move you up here for a second. I did notice that a lot of that noise, a little sizzle that was on the top end, if you crank the presence back just a little bit, then it cleaned up quite a bit, and especially if you took the, the normal volume down. So we're going to try this full up uh, extreme settings thing one more time. And maybe after I do this test, I'll put a multimeter in there. I'll see what the maximum current is that I'm um, pulling out of the amp as I'm playing. And I think the last time with this underpowered transformer, I clocked 67 watts out of this thing. So here we got a four by 12 in parallel with the uh, one by 12 here. So five speakers, a combined eight ohms. I've got the amp set correctly. We're going to fire it up and see what it sounds like. Okay, just a few more tests with this. Might as well turn it on and get it warmed up while we're waiting. Um, so these are extreme settings. One of the things about the high treble is that it actually has a bright capacitor on it. it doesn't. I need to look into that. I think it has a bright capacitor on it. And if you turn it up all the way then you get a little less trouble. One thing I've noticed is this amp in its current configuration without all the crazy feedback and stuff is that it doesn't have quite a lot of treble to it. So it might be that I just need to back that off a little bit. Maybe back this off a bit also. And uh, the presence control at high settings, about right there, it takes some of that sizzle out of it. So I'm going to try these settings a little bit, um, both channels. And we're going to see what that sounds like.
I've got the amp at the extreme setting still. Right now I have it on standby so that I don't blow my ears out with all this stuff. I'm going to put some headphones on and flip this on. I have my uh, multimeter here reading the uh, voltage across the one ohm resistor that's in the plate circuit. This is going to give me plate current for one of the tubes. And in theory, if we times that by two, we should get the uh, output for the tubes. So this meter doesn't have a max like the one when I originally did this. And uh, that I would kind of grab the, the final value and hold it there to its peak value. This one I'm just going to have to watch. So I'm recording it so I can watch it back later. So here we go. Wow, I think I saw up to like 130 milliamps running through that resistor. That's kind of insane. Um, have to do some calculations. This is going to be peak. This is not RMS. Um, but, I mean, wow. This is a true RMS multimeter, actually. I'm not sure if that really works in DC. But, um, yeah. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention is the nice thing about this is it doesn't go crazy and squeal all over, all over the place with this amp the way it was before when you, uh, if you were to play while you had the multimeter leads um, plugged in, it would just go nuts. One other thing that I want to do is I want to see what the plate voltage is. So I'm going to check that out really quick. Okay, to check plate voltage, I'm just going to take this, I'm going to plug it onto here and then take it on standby. So. We'll see what we get there. Looks like right around 450 volts. And this is idle with everything dialed back a little bit. A lot less hiss, a little bit more manageable, and really in an environment like this basement, I mean, this is way too much volume for this area. That master volume is going to play a really big role down here. Um, so we're going to try this. Later, I'm going to put the master volume down to where it's actually a level where it's not going to blow my ears up with the 50 watts. See what it sounds like. And then I'm going to put it down into pentode mode at 20 watts and turn it up and see what the difference is between those two. run one more experiment. I noticed that there was a lot of current being output by the power tube when we were running this thing right at maximum. Almost didn't even make sense. But power is a function of current and voltage. And of course this is DC dissipation. Whether or not that's real AC power, I don't know. But so the question is how does our voltage behave? Is there sag? You know, am I really getting that 450 volts and 138 milliamps? Or what does it drop down to? So obviously, I mean, I don't have a lot of resolution on this meter. It's not going to be reading really fast. Um, but we're going to try to, uh, with, with the other video, I went through and, and grabbed uh, each little point, data point that I could make out on the screen here. So I'll play for a little while. I'll do the same thing. And maybe what I'll do is take the maximum current and the lowest voltage, and that's likely going to be the maximum power output. We'll see how it goes. Okay, I've got my data. It looks like there was kind of some weird things where it said overload. I don't know if that was kind of a recovery spike that happened, but I saw things between like 600 volts and about 390 volts. So I'll go through the video, take it frame by frame, and try to figure out what those numbers are, and do some calculations. 
Okay, I've got my data up on the screen. I just take over the pointer here. You can see that this row right here is the current values that I read through one plate of the EL34. Um, and over here is the new data, which is the voltage values between the plate and cathode of that same tube. So we noticed that at idle, we were at about, uh, let's see, 38 milliamps here and 449 volts DC. But we take all this stuff, I mean, I think the maximum current looks like 134.8. Actually, there's 135.8 right there. So 135 milliamps running through one of those tubes. And um, now I don't have a correlation between um, what the current was and what the, at the same time. But over here, we notice that we're getting around 400 volts DC um, when we are at maximum. So the average of the currents over here was 123.6 milliamps and the average of the voltage was 100 and or sorry 403.876 whatever so about 404 volts and if we take those and multiply them together then that gives us through one of the tubes that is going to give us 50 watts 49.919 pretty much 50 times that by two through two tubes and theoretically we are putting out 100 watts out of this 50 watt amplifier. Now I've heard that these watts are, are rated for a clean and that they could almost double when you put them into clipping. And I believe that's true um, based off of these. Now, some people have said, well, this is a peak to peak. And if you're gonna do RMS, then you're going to get something at you know, 0 0.707 times that, which is about 70 watts. So again, um, looking at just the DC um, peak to peak maximum dissipation, we're looking at about 100 watts to this amplifier. So be sure you're not trying to play this through a uh, a 50 watt speaker, or maybe even a 75 watt speaker, like I've done very recently. Anyway, uh, just kind of an interesting experiment. Reading a lot of things on the internet about. Um, what re I mean, this is not the right way to measure this, but it's the same way that a lot of people will set their bias. You know, they'll get that resistor value, they'll get the voltage value, they'll set the currents to where they're going to read about 17 watts because that's your 70% plate dissipation. And so using this, so if, if, if you're gonna say, all right, well, that's going to be where I want it to be, then I mean, we're going to almost 200% plate dissipation. And maybe that's okay because we're running like a you know class a b amplifier so i don't know there's a lot of things this is not the right way to do it but when we talk about biasing and having it a certain value and then when we get full output shouldn't that have some sort of correlation anyway that's the experiment here we have a marshall data sheet for their model 1987 from who knows when You'll notice that in the power output section, it states that the typical power output at clipping 3% distortion is 50 watts RMS, but at 10% distortion, it is showing an output of 90 watts. Something to think about. Thanks for watching.